you are new or visiting with us today, let me bring you up to speed by saying that we have recently been focusing on, uh, within the majority of our Sunday teaching times, I guess is the right word to put that, we've been focusing on selected sections of the New Testament, the second half of the Bible, if you're not necessarily familiar with Scripture and the way the Bible works, it is in two parts, Old Testament and New Testament. We've been really focused recently on the New Testament, following in line with the printed content of a, a little daily Bible reading guide called Thrive that we read and suggest that others may like to read if they choose to do so. You don't have to, but it's a part of the way we're structuring our teaching and learning. And last week, Pastor Matt, our teaching pastor, continued to work his way through unpacking the book of Hebrews, which is not necessarily a particularly easy book for us in this era to understand. Um, it was a tremendous message last week. Not that the others aren't as well, but last week's message focused purely on faith. And if you wanted to try and grab a sentence that would have summarised what was being said last week, it was the simple understanding that we need to be encouraged to let God be God. To let God be God. Rather than trying to control everything ourselves in an effort to play God in our own lives. If you haven't had a chance to or the opportunity to hear that message, I would encourage you to do so. Jump online or speak to someone at the help desk and see how you can access that message. I raise it because one of the comments Matt made in the context of that message really grabbed my attention. That's not to say that the rest of it didn't, but there was one sentence that jumped out at me, and that was this. Life is not about the how, but it's always about the who. Life is not about the how, but it's always about the who. In other words, we will all walk different pathways. We will all walk through different experiences. That's exactly what we've just been acknowledging. Even on a day like today, Father's Day, we're going to approach it very differently, dependent upon where we're at and what has occurred in our particular journey and pathway. So we're all different. We're all walking in different ways. But what really counts is not how we're walking or where we're walking but who we're walking with. Or well, my mother would probably correct my grammar and say, with whom we are walking. Connecting to God, trusting in God, walking with God, that's what really counts. Knowing God, learning more about him, his nature, his character, his attributes and his identity, this is the foundation of life. That's the rock-solid principles and platform upon which everything else is built. I was reminded of this very clearly in my own Thrive readings over the past couple of weeks when we have been in the book of Hebrews and I saw a couple of things that I thought I would bring to our attention this morning. Hebrews 8.3 is describing the past when it explains that every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, which we go now, what, what, what is that saying? What does that mean? In plain, accessible English for us today in 2019, it's describing a process a process of making a contribution and following the rules, offering gifts and offering sacrifices. But just a couple of verses later in Hebrews 8, 6, we see that what God brings to the table through Jesus is an absolute game changer. Jesus starts teaching and demonstrating and living something as described in Scripture far superior, far superior to the original thinking. Hebrews goes on in this passage to describe the covenant and the ministry of Jesus. The covenant being the promise, the promises, and the ministry being the actions. And explains for us that Jesus is actually showing us a much better way to live, which far exceeds just the standard operating procedure of gifts and sacrifices, contribution and rules. It's not saying that those things are bad. It's just saying that Christ has come to show a better way, a far superior way than just making a contribution and following the rules, offering gifts, offering sacrifices. Jesus said, actually, there's a better way and it far exceeds what you were doing before. Jesus stands clearly and says, it's all about relationship. It's all about relationship. It's all about a genuine connection to God. Jesus is basically saying, please, please stop thinking about and focusing 
on religion and religious practice and start again. Start again and renew your perspective to base your life now on relationship, not religion and religious practice. And God brings it home and seals the deal just a couple of verses later. Again, this is all contained within a few verses in Hebrews chapter 8. A few verses later in Hebrews 8, 10 to 12, God says in describing this new covenant, and I will be their God and they will be my people and I will forgive them and I will remember their sins no more. Why? Because in verse 11, they will all know me. Relationship. They will all know me. Relationship. Life, it seems, from a biblical explanation and standpoint, is about far more than just gifts and sacrifices, far more than just making a contribution and following the rules. It's about faith and action. It's about the love and the promise of God expressed through the ministry and presence of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, accessed by us when we choose to walk in relationship with him. Relationship, relationship, relationship. I'm told that real estate is all about position, position, position. Real estate agent. Is that true? Position, position, position. Location, location, location. <laughs> it's obviously changed. <laughs> Being a, a real estate mogul, as I am, I... Uh, not. <laughs> if that's true, and I'm happy to believe that it is, then I would take a step further and say I think life is about relationship, relationship, relationship. And you know that to be true. Just think about it even on a human level. Think about the relationships that you have on a daily basis. Think about the individuals that you mix and meet with every single day. Think about how your life is changed one way or the other by the people with whom you relate, by the people that you meet, talk to, connect with, and have relationship with. Think about every single person that you're going to meet and mix with even in the upcoming week, for example, and the relationships that you have. Think about the person who makes your coffee in the morning. I'm not sure why that was first on my mind. What about the people who teach your children at school? What about the people you work alongside or study with? What about the people who live in your street? The people with whom you share a home? Relationships in a general sense, in a life sense, are incredibly important. And if that's true, and we know it to be true, because we, it's a lived experience every day, then how much more important is the most important relationship that we can ever have, our relationship with God? The power and the strength and the importance of relationship and fundamentally relationship with God is one of the patterns and principles that God consistently explains and presents and demonstrates in his word, the Bible. And it reminds me, even as we think that through, just how important it is to read the Bible, just to read scripture. Yeah, I think sometimes, and, and maybe it's a personal opinion, so I'll offer it anyway. I think we get caught sometimes in listening to the greatest preacher from America and England and here and here, and we've, we've, we're fed with so much information because of the way the world is now a very small global village and we've got access to so many things so quickly. So we feed on so much stuff, but sometimes we forget to just simply read the Bible. Read the Bible and let God speak to you. We kind of get to a point where we believe if you haven't got 17 degrees and 45 years history, then you can't possibly receive any understanding or revelation from God. That is so not true. Every one of us can hear from God and God wants to speak and is speaking. The question is, are we listening? I would suggest sometimes turn off everything else, just open the Bible. Just read scripture, see what God wants to say. It's a manual for life. I was told once that Bible, B-I-B-L-E, stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. I kind of like that. And if you boil it all down, there are basically two groups. This is really simple theology for you, but you've, you can get this. So I think I can too. You boil it all down, there are basically two groups that God has put together for his glory and our growth, family and church. And it's actually our ability to understand and manage the relationships within those two groups 
that is hugely important to our lives and how it unfolds. So we need to be focused, deliberate and determined to strengthen the relationships in our families and in our church. In his name. Why? So that we can learn as much as we can. So that we can do our very best to live the life that God wants us to live with faith and obedience. In fact, the Bible tells us if you take that the heart of Genesis 1 and the heart of Romans 8 and put them together, that God created us in his image and as his children. In his image and as his children. He calls us and wants us to be his heirs. Now it's our choice as to whether or not we accept that position, whether or not we choose to love and follow him. But if we do step into that relationship, the Bible actually records and shows that we then have the opportunity to refer to God as Abba, Father, which I'm sure some of you have learned and studied far more than I have. It means Dad. I think that's amazing. That the creator of the universe, God, our Lord and Saviour, wants to give you and I the opportunity to call him Dad. I really like that. I do understand, however, that as we've already referred to, that's a hard picture for some people to grasp because you may not have or did not have a great relationship with your natural father and therefore it's hard for people to access the picture of God as father, as dad. But I want to really encourage you today, this morning, that if that is you, if you find yourself in that position and predicament, keep your head up. Keep your chin up. Keep your eyes fixed and focused on him. Because there is healing and restoration available in God through Christ and the Holy Spirit. I truly believe that. Where there is damage, where there are broken relationships, and I know that they'll be represented here today, we know that. God wants to restore and rebuild. So even today, even if it's a little close to home, open your hearts, keep your mind open and keep listening for the most important relationship in life, a connection to God through Christ. That's the heart of the matter. That's why I called this little message this morning, quite simply, the heart of the matter. Because despite everything else, everything else, the most important thing is the relationship with God, the heart of the matter. A few years ago, I was asked to speak at a function for another denomination in Geelong, a relatively conservative denomination. And during the course of that day, I was asked in one of their open sessions, speaking multiple times and being open to discussion and question, I was asked a really poignant question. And I wanted to answer it honestly, but wisely. The question was, why had I, as a young man, chosen to move away from a more mainstream conservative church where I was raised into a more evangelical Pentecostal setting. And I explained that as a child I'd been given an incredible opportunity to learn much about God the King and God the Creator and God the Powerful and He's all of that. But it had all seemed a little distant to me because I hadn't at that stage, stage learned much about God the Father. And I wanted to hear more about God the Father. I wanted to understand God in a more personal way. Because the relationship with God is the heart of the matter. This morning, it's not enough for me to open up by saying that. We have to then at least spend a few moments investigating how we actually build a relationship with God the Father. It's, it's one thing to say, yes, that's the heart of the matter, that's the most important thing, we get it. And on today, Father's Day, we recognise the heart of the Father, we recognise it's the heart of the matter. Yes, Tim, I get it, but where do I start? If I am feeling a little disconnected or in fact I feel like I've never really been connected, where do I start to build that relationship with God? How do I get to know my Heavenly Father? In prayer and preparing for today, I felt there would be some great learning or opportunity to learn 
if we just quickly read through the story known in Scripture as the lost son or the prodigal son. If we or people we know are feeling lost or disconnected from our Heavenly Father, this is a wonderful story as an encouragement to help us find our way home. It's taken from Luke 15, 11 to 31. I'm going to read it, so just have a listen to it. And then three quick things. We won't be here forever. I know that many of you will need to move quickly to family functions. I don't want to hold you. I do want to give you something to think about today and through the week. Luke 15, 11 to 31. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and here I am starving to death. I will set out and I will go back to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was out in the field. And when he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So... He called out to one of the servants and asked him, what was going on? Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, says, look, after all these years, I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You, You never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends, but when this son of yours who's squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. So building my relationship with God, three things to help me learn more about my father. I can learn more about my father, number one, through my father's hugs. Luke 15, 20, so he got up and he went to his father and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion and ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. Why don't we see this more often? So much work and research has been done to show the link between the display of physical affection and verbal encouragement shown by dads to their children and their sense of worth and value. It's one of the most basic needs of every human on the planet to be loved and accepted. And one of the greatest ways we can affirm love and acceptance from a very early age is through a simple hug from Dad. I suspect it's because we now live in an age where two things have happened. Firstly, it's become slowly less and less manly to show physical affection. It's also become more and more potentially dangerous for fear of what people may think about your intentions. This has to change. This has to change. What is the picture that God is painting for us here? What is the pattern that God is establishing? He's teaching us to show our love for our children with passion and compassion. Even when they're in a season of not quite walking with us at the time. As God himself does for us, loving us with passion and compassion even when we wander. The Bible says, while he was still a long way off, the father had compassion for him and ran to him and hugged him and kissed him. How many of us have had times when we were a long way off from God? I guarantee you, even when we're a long way off, he's still there waiting. 
and he's still ready to run toward you as soon as you turn for home. We don't need to be perfect. We just need to be teachable, learning, growing, ready. God, our Heavenly Father, loves us, loves you, loves me, and wants to scoop us up in his arms and show us just how much he loves us. We can learn a lot about our Father through that compassion and passion, through my Father's hugs. Secondly, we can learn through my Father's hands. How many people have ever noticed or commented on their dad's hands? Hands are different, aren't they? If you were to study my hands, that's not an invitation, that's just a comment. They're very smooth. These are pastor's hands. You know, <laughs> never done a day's real work in their lives. <laughs> Clean fingernails, no scratches. I moisturise. <laughs> I've got friends who've got really rough hands because they work with their hands. They might be mechanics or builders or they do other things. It doesn't make one set of hands better than the other. It just describes what you do. I think hands are really, really important. And in this story, as I looked, looked through it, I realised just how many things hands can represent. In life, hands represent guidance and prayer and instruction and protection and discipline, provision. In this story, it was the father's hands that played a great but potentially unnoticed role. It's the father's hands that actually create the estate that the son wants to share in. It's the father's hands that then give the son the share of the, the estate when he asks for it. It's the father's hands that no doubt were held firmly in prayer as he waited for him to return home. And then it's the father's hands that reach out and touch him when he does return. And it's the father's hands that probably wipe the tears from his eyes and his own when he did return. It's the father's hands that then issue instructions to the servants to say, look, organise the feast. And it's the father's hands that clap and rejoice when they celebrate together because he's home. And it's the father's hands that then reconcile the two sons. Those hands were doing a lot. Father's hands are really important. It's fascinating to think about the hands of God because this is a picture of God. So God, my father, our father, has hands that are creating, hands that are giving. Reaching and touching and consoling, instructing, rejoicing, reconciling. My father's hands. If you're feeling at all disconnected from God, walking through a difficult time or season, I would heavily encourage you to place yourself back in the hands of the father. One of my favourite poems is actually called Hands. Some of you have heard me read it before, but I felt it was so appropriate today so I don't... I hope you don't mind hearing it again. I've changed it slightly. It's just called hands. A basketball in my hands is worth about $100. But a basketball in LeBron James's hands would be worth about $100 million. A footy in my hands is worth about $150. But a footy in Gary Ablett's hands is worth at least a million dollars. It all depends whose hands it's in. A tennis racket, it's not a lot of use in my hands. But a tennis racket in Ash Barty's hands can win a French Open. A golf club in my hands is an absolute waste of time. But a golf club in the hands of Adam Scott led to a world number one ranking. It all depends whose hands it's in. A staff in my hands is just a walking stick. But a staff in Moses' hands parted the Red Sea. A slingshot in my hands is just a crudely connected twig and rubber band. But a slingshot in David's hands is a mighty weapon that defeated an entire army. It all depends whose hands it's in. Two fish and five loaves in my hands is just a couple of fish sandwiches. Two fish and five loaves in God's hands feeds thousands and changes lives. Nails in my hands just make a bloodied mess. Nails in the hands of Jesus produced salvation for the entire world. All depends whose hands it's in. And in John 10, 29, when Jesus was talking about us 
those who've chosen to follow and serve God and live in relationship with him. He made this comment, no one can snatch them out of my father's hand. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. What a reassuring statement from Jesus himself. Let's stay connected to God. Let's stay in the hands of our father, the hands of God. Third thing, we can learn through my father's hugs, we can learn through my father's hands, we can learn through my father's house. House. A home is more than just a place of residence. A home says something about us, it provides protection and care and shelter and peace and security and a place to belong. In the parable that we've just read, the story of the lost son, the son realised that home, his dad's place, was a great place to be after all. And he wanted to go home. He wanted to return to his father's house. You may remember the story of Jesus as a small child, recorded in Luke chapter 2, when his parents, Mary and Joseph, were worried sick about him. They lost him, couldn't find him. Do you remember where they eventually found him? (laughs) At the temple. And what was his response? Well, didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? (laughs) In other words, where else did you expect me to be? This is where I belong. His father's house was something Jesus talked a lot about and took very seriously. You may remember his reaction also in John chapter 2 when he discovered the way the temple was being treated, turned into a place for profit and trading, to which he declared, how dare you turn my father's house into a market? It's not a market, it's not a theatre, it's not a cafe, although all three of those things are lovely and great and have their place, but not in the house of God. My father's house is a home of worship, a house of prayer, a place of love and belonging, a place for family and growth and teaching and encouragement scriptural learning that's a big place too by the way it's not exclusive the doors are wide open Jesus reminded us of that in John 14 when he said in my father's house there are many rooms many rooms so if I was going to summarize this and as I do I'd love the musos to come back up please the summary is really simple this morning that the most important thing in life, the heart of the matter, is the relationship with our heavenly Father, God. And Father's Day is a great day to be conscious of that. And to build that relationship with my heavenly Father, to learn more about my heavenly Father, I can look at those three simple things taken from that one parable in Scripture. I'm reminded of how much I'm loved by my father through his hugs. I'm reminded of how much he does for me through his hands. And I'm reminded of where I belong because of his house. The heart of the matter is that God loves us and that desperately, desperately is looking for us to return home to him. I want to pray for us this morning just before the guys sing. But I want to pray that Two things, I guess, for those who feel like they want to establish or re-establish a a relationship with God that you may be feeling a little disconnected at the moment. And secondly, for those who feel that they would like to receive some healing directly from God for the restoration and rebuilding of broken relationships. I don't want to dwell on it this morning. I'm not going to do anything weird. We just want to let God be God so all I'm going to do is ask you to stand and I'm going to pray and we're going to ask God to really speak to and minister to us individually as we respond so Heavenly Father in this environment this morning of safety and security that comes only because of you because of your presence and your love our prayer right now on Father's Day 2019 is that we would absolutely understand your role in our lives as our Father. Lord, no matter how we have arrived at the day, no matter what our natural experience has been, we don't brush that under the carpet, we acknowledge that and we pray into that. But then we step the next step and say, God, no matter where we're up to, 
We want to fix our eyes on you. We want to understand that you as our Heavenly Father show us your love. You prove to us how much you love us and how much we're valued and accepted by you. You continue through your incredible work to shape our lives and create opportunities for us. And you call us to be part of your home, your house. We call it the church. It's your home and your house. So God, today, right now, for those who may be feeling a little distant, a little disconnected, our our prayer together is that you, Heavenly Father, would be real and present with every single person who is feeling that they've wandered a little bit, with every head bowed and with every eye closed right now. Can you just indicate to me if that prayer is for you, just so I know who I'm praying for? I'm not going to call you out the front this morning. I'm not going to do anything different. I just want to know that I'm praying. Thank you. That I'm praying for some people. Thank you. Who are acknowledging that they have or are feeling a little distant from God at the moment, a little disconnected and are wanting to return home. As that happens and those hands are being raised, you can put it down straight away again. That's great. Lord, I say right now, thank you. Right now in your name, in your name, you can see those people, you can see their hearts and lives and I pray that in your absolute sovereignty and divinity and great love that you would literally pour your love into those lives. That from today forward, things would be different. As they step back toward you, you like that father in the story of the prodigal son, wrap your arms around them and say, welcome home and celebrate with them. New life, new chapter, new era, something different. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And for those who are feeling or have felt recently that there are relationships that are a little disconnected, like the two sons in our story, a bit upset with each other, perhaps not seeing the full picture, whatever it may be, not looking for fault or blame, but looking to see restoration and repair in your name. We pray, Heavenly Father, for anyone here this morning who's experienced or is experiencing that sense of disconnect in a relationship. And I again ask with every eye closed and head bowed, if that prayer is for you, can you just indicate to me right now, thank you, and thank you, and thank you, thank you. You can put those arms down. Thank you up the back. Appreciate it. Lord, as we see those hands right now, sensitive to what you're doing, God, what you're shifting and moving in people's lives, I ask, and as I see that, this prayer is for those people who've indicated that, that there's, there, there have been... It's actually not even a a wall. It's more just like a a, a tiny little line of rocks. So it doesn't look big. It doesn't look like it would be an obstacle or we would prevent being able to move forward. But it has been something that has stopped. There is something that has been stopping you from moving forward and stepping into restoration and changing the relationship status. God is now removing those rocks removing those rocks. So in your your head and your heart right now, just see and understand that God is working. God is shifting the barriers, removing the obstacles, taking away those little jagged rocks that have been in the way so that with clean heart, pure heart and clean hands, you can step forward and step into restoration and repair in God's name. Not in your own strength, not because you've done something wonderful, but because God has spoken and you have received. Thank you, Lord, as those relationships are repaired in your name. God, on this day, 1st of September, Father's Day 2019, significant things are shifting and changing in our lives. We thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you for being our Heavenly Father. We love you, we bless you. And as we sing this song together, Lord, we sing it with heart and strength and gusto and we sing it as part of our response to you to say, Lord, we love you and we lift your name purposefully. We want to praise and glorify you because you are our Heavenly Father. Let's sing in his name. Come on.